Hello everybody, welcome back to the True Crime Corner with Ntabi. My name is Ntabi Singh Zotezi and I talk about true crime cases. So with today's case, um, I will be talking about Stuart Wilkin. Just to add my usual disclaimer, I mean no disrespect to the victims involved and any of the family members involved. The videos that I do upload is for educational purpose and to shed light on the tragic and heinous crimes that these people commit. And as well as also just to add on this disclaimer, this video has a lot of violence, child abuse, um, substance abuse, sodomization, pedophilia, cannibalism, yeah, I think that's about it. So if you are triggered by all, any of these things, please do not watch um, this video. I will catch you on the next, oh, also in sexual abuse. So if you're triggered by any of these, please do not watch this video. I will catch you on my next video. This case starts with um, a young boy. A young boy, relatively around six months, who is left in a telephone telephone booth in Boxburg with his elder sister, who's about two years old. So he only spent this little boy only spent the first six months of his life with his biological parents and was left in this telephone booth. Luckily, not all hope was lost because they were found by a domestic worker who worked near the area and she took them back to her employer. So him, her employer's name is not known, but he was also known as Doop. Doop took in these two kids, but unfortunately for the first two years of this boy's life, he was tremendously abused by dupe so it was around this time that his sister disappeared and he was going through this abuse by himself um dupe would would chain this little boy would chain this little boy to the well, with the dogs and forced him to eat out of the dog bowls and he would make this little boy watch him while he committed acts of bestiality with his dogs and forced him to lick, to lick his genitalia after he's done. This boy went through a lot for the first two years of his life. He was said that, it was said that he had a lot of lies, he was malnourished and he was not taken care of like a young toddler should be taken care of. And this was noticed by Dupe's neighbors and they took pity on the boy and took him in to come and live with them. So they wanted to legally adopt this little boy, but they could not do so because they needed the consent of the biological mother. Dupe says that he remembers that there was a woman who once came and to Dupe's um, house and offered this little boy some sweets but he refused later on in later discussions in his life he found out that that was his biological mother and he came that's when sorry he, that the mother didn't come to dupe's house they came to the neighbor's house and that's when she handed over the rights for this young boy to be adopted the neighbors are mr and mrs wilkin so around this time mr and mrs wilkin adopted this little boy and named him Stuart Wilkin. He was around two years old and as time went on they realized that he is a bit of a difficult child to deal with because not obviously considering the trauma that he had been through in the first two years of his life. So he was a bit of a bit difficult child. He bit people, he hit them and he was a bit troublesome. So he started school and he failed the first grade. Now, after failing the first grade, Mrs. Wilkin didn't understand what was wrong with him and took it as he's just being lazy and he's not trying hard enough to perform in school. Whereas he was genuinely not doing okay as 
a young child should be. So Mrs. Wilkin decided that she is going to take away his Christmas presents away from him. And this angered this angered the little boy and he vowed that he will not try to do good ever again in school. And so he went to grade three and he failed this grade three times. And this is when the school and Mr. and Mrs. Wilkin decided that they should send him to a special to a special kids class. So around this time in school, when he was sent to the special kids class, he became bullied and not only by his peers, but he said that the teacher also enticed the bullying. So he began to, to become very violent in school. And he came back, one of the days he came back after he was bullied, he came back and he pushed or he shoved the teacher or he became violent with the teacher. And he was sent to the principal's office. So this is around the time when corporal punishment was not frowned upon. And so the teacher beat up on Stuart in front of the whole entire school. So this became very, so he got into trouble at school. He got into trouble at home because at home he started wetting the bed and he got in a lot of trouble for doing that. Stuart also mentions that around this time at the age of eight is when he started to smoke marijuana excessively and full time. So I think it was before or after Around this time, Stuart Wilkins' step, okay, not say father, adopted father passed on. And this took a toll on the little boy because he saw this man as the only positive male figure in his life. And now that he is gone, he's just, he felt like he was left all alone. And I'm not sure if this event took place before or after Stuart Wilkins, adoptive father, passed on, but he says that the deacon at his church called him one time to his home to come after Sunday school to come and spend the day with him and his family. But when he got there, it was only him. And he says that this deacon raped him and sodomized him. So this would impact his life tremendously and would also impact the way he acted and committed his crimes so after this after this he decided that he does not want to go into to school and after the passing of his adoptive father mrs wilkin was left all alone and she felt very overwhelmed by all the things that were happening so she reached out to welfare and decided that they're going to send Stuart to an industrial school, reform school. So he went there and things just got worse for him because he says that even at the industrial school, he was bullied, he was sodomized by his peers. And for as punishment, they left him naked. And this emphasized, this just made the sodomization worse for him. He tried running away several times and he actually did eventually ran away. He ran away and went to his adoptive aunt. But he only stayed with his adoptive aunt for a month. And she ended up giving him money to go back to where Mrs. Wilkin now is staying, which is Port Elizabeth in PE. So as he got to PE, Mrs. Wilkin made sure that there was a court judgment for him and the court ruled and judge that said that said that um, Stuart Wilkin will not be forced to go back to the reformery school but he must complete his grade 11. 
so he actually did eventually complete his grade 11 and after completing grade 11 he went and joined the army but this only lasted four months because at the army he tried to commit suicide and was forced to come back home when he came back home he went and got himself a job he went and got himself a job but he got injured and started getting a disability check so around this time he was 18 and this was in 1984 and this is when he also met his soon-to-be wife lynn so after a year when Strit and and Lynn got together, they gave birth to a baby girl on the 25th of December, 1985, and they named her Wane. So after this, their marriage was not, I'm sorry, they didn't get married. Um, their relationship, their relationship was a bit unstable. They eventually did get married, but I'm just being too forward. Um, so the relationship was a bit unstable and it was not a healthy relationship because Wane, I mean, not Lynn always called into the police and complained that Stuart was always smoking marijuana and smoking marijuana around the children. So welfare had to step in and they threatened the both of them that if they do not get their act together, they're going to take away the eldest daughter because they did have an eldest daughter because when Lynn came to the relationship, she already had a child. So after this, um, around 1990, they felt like they were pressurized into being married. So they did get married in 1990. And this 1990 is a very important year because this is the year that um, Stuart confessed his first murder. He committed his first murder in 1990. And this was a little boy. Yes, little. He was a teen, but he was little. He was 15 years old and he was a homeless child. He propositioned, he was said that he propositioned food for sex. So he wanted, he exchanged sex with this man and Stuart sodomized him and strangled him and left his body in a nearby school in Sigmund, 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 Port Elizabeth. On October 3rd in 1990, when Stuart and Lynn were having one of their arguments, Stuart went out and he went out to get a prostitute. And this was Virginia Heisman. She was 25 years old and they agreed on 50 rand for exchange, in exchange for the sexual intercourse. So they did have sex, but after this, um, Stuart was not was not satisfied enough and tried to force himself to force himself on Virginia to have anal sex but she did not want to and he got really angry and ended up strangling Virginia with her own clothes and leaving her body at a nearby school as well so three months after him killing Virginia he went out and got another prostitute on January 31st of January 1991, he got a prostitute named Mercia Paphanes. And they agreed on a certain amount for the exchange. But when they, she, he took her to St. George's Park, which is around PE, and Mercia requested, sorry, Mercia requested payment before they started to have sex and he refused. So after Stuart refusing to pay up front the money that him and Mercia agreed upon, he got angry and said these following words to her. Sex is a natural act which should be freely available and no woman or a man should be allowed to charge for it or refuse it. I mean, I could say so much about just that one quote that he said, but I'm not going to get into that. So after this, his relationship with with Lynn just was not going well for him. And 
they started to get into more frequent fights and eventually you know she always kept on calling calling the cops on him for smoking marijuana and they took him to a mental institute and was diagnosed with psychopathy so psychopathy is in line with mental disorders and there is no medication to help cure it but there are treatment treatments that they can place that can play, that they can place an individual on so that he can have a good life or a normal life but he refused any of the treatment and when he came back uh, Lynn was already so tired of him and when he came back Lynn called the cops and he noticed that the cops were coming so he tried he took a lot of pills trying to commit suicide but he did not like his attempt was not successful i suppose so lynn filed for divorce so when lynn filed for divorce she took along one and her eldest daughter to go live with her so lynn also eventually decided to get remarried and whenever Stuart came by the house to come and see Wane, um, he had to vi- make his visits outside on the pavement because he got into fights and arguments with, with Lynn's new husband. So eventually he also decided to get remarried or no, get into a relationship. But before he did this, he vowed that he would never sleep with a white woman again and this was because he was afraid he was afraid that if he slept with a white woman or a white prostitute it might be his sister and he is scared of committing incest which is a sin i know this sounds crazy how is he scared of committing incest when he has done such outrageous things to little boys and females um but as normal as normal serial killers, well, I can't say they're normal. Serial killers have, they do outrageous things, but they have certain rules that they are very strict with, and this happened to be one of Stuart's rules that he does not want to sleep with white women anymore because he doesn't want to commit incest. So he started dating, and eventually got married to a colored woman named veronica veronica already had two sons so he was not fully satisfied and he could not maintain a, an erection so he took out a knife and cut georgina's private so he used the knife as a form of his genitalia and she got stabbed in her private areas more than 20 times and not only that that is not the worst that he did he cut off her nipples and ate them this is the first case where he committed cannibalism uh, during a crime or during one of the killings that he committed after this you know he went back and forth between happy valley and and veronica so he was in between happy valley and staying with veronica so during this time he went to go visit his daughter he to go visit his daughter and they stayed on the pavement as per usual and wane's stepsister says that the last time she saw wane was when she was sitting with her dad at the pavement but she did not come back home she did not come back in the house and she was never seen again so Sue says that she took one to happy valley so that he she can show her one of the most happiest memories that he has ever had in his life um he loved happy valley because i feel like perhaps in his childhood when he stayed with the wilkins that's where he shared some of his most um precious memories so that's what he said that he went to go take um one to happy valley but then when they got to them his makeshift house um, he said that Wane um, complained to him and said that her stepfather was not treating 
herself and her mother properly and did not get enough food and said that the stepfather sexually abused Wane, sexually assaulted Wane. So it, he took it upon himself to check Wane, if, to check if Wane was still a virgin. First of all, there's so many wrong things with that, you know. Um, and he said that he found out that Wane was not a virgin and he decided to kill Wane because he wanted her to go to heaven um, directly from him, you know. But he didn't dispose of her body. He kept the body until it decomposed. He slept next to the body until it decomposed. And after it decomposed, he placed it under a trampoline of some sort and kept the skeletons and made, put clothes, um, sorry, not, he didn't keep the skeletons. He made um, a body figure out of the clothes that he had that belonged to Wane and he continued to sleep next to those clothes. He said that he had and he did not rape or sleep with his daughter. So after this, um, so after this, his relationship with Veronica was starting to become a bit rocky because both, um, both of Wane, I mean, Veronica's sons, um, accused Stuart of sodomization and they took it to the police station. So when he was asked about this, he fled and he disappeared and started living behind Happy Valley full time now. He got another prostitute named Katrina Klassen, who was 22 years old, and he did his usual routine. Before payment or after payment, he strangled her, um, sodomized her, and stuck um, a plastic down. He sodomized and killed Katrina Klassen. So he continued to live in PE, and he became very popular because he wore the same clothes every day and he so he was very known by the world by the locals in pe as butibur because of his appearance you know so one day he came across a young boy named henry bakers and he's he walked with henry bakers to his makeshift home behind happy valley so Henry Baker's friend noticed that Henry was walking with this man and he knew who he was. So he ran towards him and asked um, Stuart, what are you doing with Henry? And, Hen and Stuart replied with, mind your own business. So, oh, I didn't put on mascara, all right. So, mind your own business. So he got to that was the last time henry bakers was ever seen and when questioned he said that henry wanted to know more so he said that this little boy wanted to know more about sex and he went back to the makeshift house they went back to his makeshift house and masturbated on the boy and eventually killed him but he was not suspected because the family knew him and had once slept over at their home, at their residence. So, but the young boy, um, Henry's friend, eventually came out to the police and told the police what he knew. And it was the same officer who was working on the disappearance of Wane. Um, Stuart was eventually arrested. Stuart was eventually arrested and... He had an alibi, but he had an alibi, so they released him based on that alibi. But eventually the police found out that his alibi was false, so he got rearrested. And one of the psychologists who was working his case said that he... He left the room that the consultation room that they were in and made sure that Stuart was facing 
the wall and the wall which had the psychologist this forensic psychologist's daughter and his plaques of how many years he's been a psychologist and left the room so when the psychologist came back into his office he found that he um Stuart was staring at his daughter's picture and the first two words that came out of his mouth as he surrendered he said i am sick i'm sick and that's when he confessed all of his murders he confessed 10 murders but the police were only able to find eight bodies plus the two of Wane and henry bakers so during the court trial he did not show any emotion he seemed calm the only time he portrayed any emotion was when they brought in his daughter's skull Wane's skull into the courtroom and he couldn't handle it and he excused himself he didn't excuse himself to go cry and sulk and just be sad he excused himself to go masturbate um this is the type of man that Stuart will kill so after he excused himself at the courtroom he went to go masturbate this is the type of man that he was he is um he excused himself to go masturbate and this came to the conclusion that he couldn't have held himself when he was with his daughter to not have raped her or not have slept with her and also the conclusion that he found pleasure in death and he ejaculated when people died so he was found he was found guilty on seven counts of murder um a lifetime imprisonment so he is not getting out of prison anytime soon and the judge said that if the death sentence was still available he would have given it to him because he is not a man that should be in society it was very difficult for the psychiatrist that at the mental hospital that he was at early prior earlier on in his life to see the type of man he was he was so good at hiding his second life i suppose he was really good at being normal and also doing crazy things at the same time so I think this is one of South Africa's most horrific serial killers. Oh, I don't think I've mentioned that this is a South African case. So, Butibur is a South African man. And when translated, um, Butibur means that brother farmer. So, I mean... I'm sure even if he got released anytime soon, he would still commit his crimes because he cannot help it. He has an urge to just rape, sodomize, specifically young children, young boys, perhaps because he was abused when he was a child and women prostitutes because he perhaps felt neglected as a child and wanted to take out his anger on women because his mother neglected him later on his mother did come back and say that he came to come fetch his sister but left him behind and i'm sure this was not this made things worse perhaps thank you guys for watching my video um please subscribe please Put on your bell notifications to know when i'm uploading follow my instagram as well um it's at tabi and love